Yes, All right, let's make a formal more. introduction for our listeners. Good afternoon, Phil. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the studio of Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Phil Palmer accepted our invitation to our show. Phil, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Claudio. It's nice to meet you, man. Thank you. Man, the last two years for everybody have been very difficult with the COVID. Some people believe in the vaccine. Some people say it was a hoax fake, yeah. whatever, you know, affected everybody. And a lot, actually in Italy, a lot of people died there, United yeah. States, over 1 million people. So how you manage, how how difficult it was for you, if you're a tour musician, you couldn't tour, you know, how how's your sanity? How are you holding up now? Well, it was tough. Um, I was actually on tour in, uh, in America when it kicked off. Um, and we had a bunch of shows booked and we were supposed to do a, a rock cruise with the Die Straits Legacy Band. Mm -hmm. And so we were in Florida and um, when the first lockdown happened and um, people were saying, listen, you've got to get home. And we go, nah, it's okay. You know, they were taking no notice of it whatsoever. It was spring break in, in Florida and everywhere was you know, jumping. It was, it was very busy. So uh, we thought, okay, well, we're just, the cruise got canceled at the last minute because of COVID. And so we, we had a few days where we thought, well, we'll just stay here. Uh, and then we, start, we started getting uh, information uh, saying, listen, you've got to get home because you know, places are starting to lock down. So uh, we got the, the last flight back. I was living in Rome. So we got the last Alitalia flight back to Rome that was available. And we arrived in Rome in the middle of a lockdown. And we went from you know chaos and people everywhere from no one. And it was a real shock. Um, so I, I, I got a taxi home. I managed to find a taxi um, and I spent so the next six months at home, basically. Um, so it was a shock. Um, I uh, after a few weeks, we started to do stuff from home, um, uh, some streaming ideas and stuff like that. And just you know, trying to keep contact with, with the fans and you know, do a bit of music online. And we started a, a thing called Casa Palmer, Casa uh, Palmer House. Uh, where we would every every weekend we would do a, a, a you know two hour thing and play play a few tunes talk to a few people, and that kept us sane really um, for the next few months. Uh, you know it was something to something to do something to uh, you know to to play music for and and we'd get requests and I would play stuff online to the people that, and it got quite big and uh, at some points we were getting 8,000 people streaming you know watching it and it was it was good, wow. good, good so that, that that kept me busy and then I, I managed to uh when things calmed down a bit I, I did a few online sessions there's a studio up the street where I used and uh we we did a couple of online sessions there I did a thing for um for Trevor Horn uh, online um for Rod Stewart uh, during that period. And then another thing for the guy from Boyzone, I can't remember his name. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I managed to keep busy. Uh, Good for you. Good for as you. busy as possible. But so yeah, it was tough. It was really tough. Well, happy to be alive, man, to begin with, you know? So how yeah. many people can say that? And I heard yeah. at the beginning, many, a lot of people in Italy, in some, some towns that kind of disappeared because people were in the 60s, 70s, they were like a ghost town, you know, for whatever. Yeah. So it's very well, Rome was horrible. I mean, I, I I ventured out on my bicycle one afternoon and uh, I got sent home by the police. It was insane. Yeah, it was good. Let's go back to the beginning for people that don't know where you were you born, like in a musical family. How old were you when you perhaps began taking guitar lessons or piano lessons and Feel free to elaborate. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I did have a musical family. Um, I've got two uncles, they're still both alive, uh, in a band called The Pinks. Yeah, of course. Uh, and so uh, when I was about you know, five or six, they were already starting to, uh, to play, and uh, I got very interested in the whole music thing. And my mum bought me a ukulele, and I started to play on that when I was about five or six. And... Um, graduated to guitar when my fingers were big enough 
and uh, never looked back really. I mean, by the time I was 15, uh, I, I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And um, school was a secondary consideration really. Really? And then yeah. I imagine that at the time you had a conversation with your parents and your parents say, well, forget about music. You're not going to make any money. You know, people, people that go to music, they do stupid stuff. And then on the other hand, you say, no, no, this, this is my, my call. I know exactly what I'm doing. I will give it a try. And then. Well, yeah, it was, it was my passion. I mean, I, I, the, all I did was play guitar. I didn't study at all for anything else. And um, yeah, my dad was extremely anti me being a musician. He'd seen what was happening with the kinks, uh, the drugs and you know, the alcohol and all that stuff. And he was a policeman, so he was, you know, he was, wow. uh, he was a bit, a bit heavy on me. And uh, I got to about 17 or 18 and he said, listen, you've got to get a proper job. And um, I said, well, you know, this is my passion. He said, well, listen, I'll put it this way. If you don't get a proper job, then you're going to have to move out. And, and he threw me out basically when I was quite young and I went to live with my girlfriend for, for a few years. Uh, but we resolved it in the end after a long time. But uh, you know, he was he became my biggest fan. I, I remember one, yeah, yeah. one night. Yeah, I was, I have similar issues at home. I was born in Chile, by the way, and I came here to the United States to study. And uh, more no music. I, I'm not, I don't play any music. I don't know how to read music. But my, all my parents were into academia. And yeah. I was like a rebel, wanted to listen hours and see band. And, and uh, I was a terrible student. And, you know, and, and then eventually I did okay in my life. And if I were to tell you, it's like a miracle. You know, I end up doing yeah. okay. But it was very, very difficult at the beginning. So yeah. finally I make peace with my parents and I, I did more than they expected. So I, I turned my life around, so. It's a great little story which appears in <clears throat> in my book. Uh, this, yep. this, which I have it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, about uh, when I was working at the Albert Hall with Eric Clapton uh, during the orchestral uh, thing that he did, and I thought this is a very good moment to uh, to invite Mum and Dad to uh, to see the show. So I did, and they had a box and they had a bottle of champagne. Uh, in the box and I could see them from, from the stage and that was the first time my dad had come to see me play and I was you know this was in 90, 1990 I guess um, so there'd been like a good 20 years of no sort of non-communication with, with my dad wow. and uh, he came backstage afterwards and it was a very emotional moment because um, uh, he, you know he's, he finally said after all that time and all that that stress that um, he was proud of me and it was uh, it was good good for you man. yeah 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 good for you for me now i'm a i'm a software developer and uh, for a kid i wanted to listen to good music and i uh, was uh, chasing girls and drinking beer and whatever i i have now seven college degrees i'm a teaching fellow at the best university in the world harvard university and i Amazing. i own a company and i own three radios and I've been listening to music three hours a day for the last 50 years. I have a huge yeah. music collection, about seven, eight thousand. One is furniture there, but I have four floors of music. So, and I have seen every band in the world. So uh, now, of course, my my dad passed away, but he was very happy when I when I graduated. So, it's you know, people. You you need to do for the young crowd. You listen to music. You need to be responsible, obviously, but you need to do what. You know, follow your passion. There's no question about it. You need to do it. Yeah. There was no question in my mind. That's what I had to do. Yeah, you need to do what you need to do sometimes. And uh, what was the first band that you were involved with in, in, in like in high school, kind of 16, 17 year old? What kind of? Yeah, we, we started a little band with a few friends. Uh, I think the first one was called Eureka. And the second, second was called March Hare. And we played in the local you know, youth clubs and uh, I started to uh, understand what it was like to do gigs and started to get relaxed with it and uh, understand what I needed to do. 
and it evolved fairly quickly. Um, but my first proper break really was through through my uncles, the Kinks, because they started a studio in London called Conk Studios in 1970, I think it was. And um, I used to sort of go down there and hang out and watch, you know, watch what was going on. And um, they 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 signed a few uh, artists to their their label. They started a label, and the first was a, a, a lady from County Durham in the north of England called Claire Hamill. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. and I would I would sit at the back of the studio and just watch what was going on. And there were some good good people on those sessions. Uh, Notably, a guy called Philip Chen, who was a great bass player, who worked with uh, Rod Stewart and a lot of other stuff, Jeff Beck, I think. And so I, I got to know him and we started chatting. He was a really nice guy, very helpful. And, you know, we spoke about doing sessions and he says, yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough game, but once you, you've got a few friends in there, it's, um, you, can, you can do okay. So I, that's... That was the first session I ever did. Uh, Claire Hamill, <clears throat> they'd popped out for dinner one night and I was sitting in the studio noodling on Ray's, my Uncle Ray's Telecaster, which was a beautiful 50s sunburst with a white binding around the outside. Yep. I was just noodling away and I didn't know there's anyone there. Claire had come back and she was sitting in the control room listening. And uh, she came in the studio and she said, she said you can play. I said, well, you know, I do my best. And um, she said, I need a guitar part on this next track. Do you want to play? And that was my first session. I was about 18 or 19. Good for you, man. So you, it, you, go it ahead. Went, it went from there. Um, doing sessions, you, you kind of, uh, it's all about reputation. And if you do okay, then, you know, you, through the uh, contacts you make on that session, you, you make other contacts. And uh, that's how it started. It kind of exploded from there. I got you. And then at the time, because due to you know, your uncle and having the studio and then the lady give you a break, do you thought that when I, because you have done so much thousands of albums and thousands of sessions, you, you knew that you you prefer to stay kind of in the session business, so to speak, versus forming yeah. a band and then run their own, or, or you you yeah no, I was very it. happy, very happy on the session circuit for you know good four, uh, eight, nine, ten years probably, and yeah. I was doing a lot, you know, and I was earning a living, and um, yeah. it was uh, as I say, you know, the, the more people you work with, the more people you work with. It was one of those things, you know, to be active. Yeah. Uh, it, the word was spreading really, and uh, you know there was a couple of things to consider. You had to you know, had to be punctual. You had to be on the ball. You had to be able to play. Um, and once you've established that kind of reputation, then uh, it didn't stop. Um, and I guess the first through these connections, like the first proper band I joined was for a, an English guy called David Essex, who was yep. a a pop icon of the 70s oh, yeah. and he was a lovely guy uh it was it was pop music you know it was nothing nothing too extreme um but i uh, i went on tour with him and we did a couple of albums with him so that was really the first band i was in david essex band it was yeah. from 1974 onwards yeah. and you you were making enough money to i don't at the time you 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 left home you were living with your girlfriend i don't know maybe maybe a different lady, lady or whatever, but you were making enough money to be on your own, pay your bills, uh, get a car, whatever, right? So. Yeah, yeah, I was doing okay, yeah. In yeah. fact, David, David was very nice to me because um, at that point I'd met my, my future first wife and we were, we were dating and um, I was looking to buy my first apartment. Yeah. And... Uh, I was looking for the, uh, the deposit for, you know, I had a mortgage set up and um, I was looking for the first deposit, which at that time was 1,250 pounds, which you know, now it seems like nothing. But, uh, yeah. I, was I was chatting to David's secretary about it one afternoon and um, said that I needed to, to, to raise the deposit. And I got a call from David the next morning saying, 
I hear you need £1,250. And I said, well, yes, yeah, from the deposit. He said, there's a cheque waiting for you at the office. He said, go and pick it up. And I thought that was amazing. Um, oh my God, man. Yeah. A beautiful thing to do. And he said, just, just pay me out of future gig fees. And, uh, for the next 20 years. <laughs> it, it didn't last that long. It was, um, we managed to pay it back pretty quickly. But um, so he enabled me to buy my first apartment and get on the, the property ladder and all the rest of it. Now, so I'm very grateful for David for oh, doing that. Yeah, good for you. People don't do that stuff like that anymore, man. <laughs> you don't know. No, people don't do it. And then you, uh, another another big name also was uh, John uh, Armstrong, right? John Armstrong Trading, yeah. Yeah, I'm a trading, I'm a trading, yeah. She was popular as well at the time, right? She's great. I mean, she's still popular. Um, she's still doing gigs. Uh, I, I saw something online the other day. She's just done a done a, a series of shows. So. Nice lady, a great songwriter, uh, and and a nice band. I mean, it was it wasn't so poppy, so it was a it was a step up for me because you know suddenly I was in a nice band with good players and um, playing nice music, uh, and I enjoyed being with Joan. We did a we did a lot of stuff together during the early eighties, a couple of albums and a big world tour, and so that was a, an, another step, you know, up the ladder. Yeah. Uh, feel free to elaborate how you end up meeting Iggy Park and um, of course Mr. Yeah. David Bowie. You know, I think it was yeah. the next thing after that, right? So. That was just one of those things. I mean, the session circuit was like that. Um, I'm just trying to remember the guy's name where the connection was, but I've been doing an album for uh, Streets of London. What's his name? Can't remember. I've been doing an album in London, and uh, the guy that was producing that also produced David Bowie. And I got a call from David Bowie in the middle of the night when they were working in Berlin, him and Iggy Pop, and said, um, I've heard good reports about you, and uh, I'd like you to come to Germany to come and play on this record, which was uh, turned out to be an album called The Idiot, which yep. is a a bit of a milestone album and some great songs on there. And yeah. The first version of China Girl was on there. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Man, how was how was the environment? How was you know being in the same room with these two guys, man? It's... It was a little odd. There was an electricity between David and, and uh, Jimmy that uh, was quite hard to understand most of the time. Um, but it, it, it was yeah, you know, kind of explosive, in, and the, the sessions were happening at night um, because that's the only studio time that they could get. So we would start working at 1 a.m. and finish like at 9 or 10 in the morning. And uh, so it was a little odd, but um, as I say, there was a, a real energy between the two of them. They would wind each other up and try things out, and it was quite experimental, very good. Good for you, man. All of those. How old were you at the time? So that was that was seventy nine. I was. Um, twenty three, twenty four. Yeah, my God, man, man, you were playing with the best, the place of the best, man. Have you, have you ever looked back in your life and, you know, from your dad? Telling you, hey, get out of the house. You're you're going to be a bump. You're not going to do anything in your life. Now you look back and you play. You have played with the best of the best, from Eric Clapton, Dire Tread, David Sylvian, you know, David Bowie, Sakamoto, and so on and so forth. It's it's like a dream. One day you will wake up and say, man, what happened? Well, yeah, I mean, it was. Right? It was. I guess I I just took it for granted. It, I didn't take it for granted. Don't get me wrong. It was a very gradual curve, so it, it right, you know, yeah. it wasn't really a surprise. I mean, suddenly to find I didn't suddenly find myself in the studio with David Bowie and Iggy Pop. It was a you know, it was a journey to get there. So, um, yeah, yeah. An evolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people told me that you were very, like a you know, a normal British guy, very very humble, and uh, and uh, you are, man. You know, some people here in the United States will freak out. You know? We, 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 we just one of the names you have played, never mind all of them, you know, I tried to. 
I think you know, that's part of it, really. That's part of my my character. I'm pretty humble, and I, I'm, yeah, I can I'm always grateful. I, I don't expect to you know to play with all these you know amazing people, but it just kind of happened. And I guess yeah. you know, the the key to it all is to be able and to to be able to slot into a situation and understand you know, the music and understand the artist and be flexible and contribute something of, of yourself that's that's i think that was my what happened for me yeah how do you how do you end up uh, meeting eric clapton for the first time around that was um again it was a chance meeting really but um i was working for a very talented uh, irish singer songwriter called paul brady and we'd been on the road uh, for quite a while, a couple of albums, and we that was a really nice band. Um, and we were playing in a, a dingy little nightclub in London called the Mean Fiddler. And um, I looked down into the audience, and it was Eric Clapton. And I thought, what the hell is he doing here? And um, it turned out that um, Paul Brady had asked. Eric to play on one of his tunes that he was working on. And so Eric just popped down to the gig to, to see, to meet Paul. And they were standing in the audience and I saw him. It was a, a difficult moment, you know, just to see God staring back at you like that. Yeah. But um, we got to know each other that night and then we bumped into each other literally a few months later in Antigua. I was on holiday in Antigua. And he walked up the beach and we got chatting and um, uh, that was the start of uh, a long and very enjoyable partnership. Um, he, when we got back to London, he called me and said, listen, I'm, I'm going into the studio to record some songs and I'd like you to pop down. And so I did. And that became the Journeyman album. Wow. Which is, that's a very, very good album, man. It's a lovely album. Yeah. Great songs. Yeah. Do you think uh, he was, and then you, you know, later on you, you went on tour with him, but do you think he was in a way checking you out, testing you out to see if you can? Uh, yeah, I think the first day in the studio, he, it was definitely, um, I mean, he'd seen me play, so he, he knew I could play. Yeah. And, and so, um, but yeah, I think it, he invited me to the studio to see you know, what I could do and if I was flexible and if I could stay out of the way. <laughs> and just, you know, uh, but my, my job for, for that thing was, you know, when he, when he offered me the tour, he sent me the, uh, the album mixes and he said, listen, you know, I can't play all these parts and sing at the same time. So what you need to do is play my parts when I'm singing. And um, so that was pretty clear. I knew exactly what I needed to do. So I, you know, I did a bit of research and um, listened to some of the tunes and learned some of his licks. And um, that was the beginning of it. It was a fantastic time. Yeah. It's it difficult to learn. As I, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm not a musician. So uh, it's difficult to, to learn your part. Or, I mean, it takes a couple of days, three days to get the whole gig going and in which part um, you go in, in which part, I mean, it was easy with Eric. Um, because I mean, I've been inspired by him all my life anyway, so I kind of knew I knew his legs and I knew, um, knew what I was required to do. Um, and the rehearsals for Eric's tour were three days, um, and so you know, it wasn't a long rehearsal. I mean, it was bang, it's straight into the first gig. And uh, I started to love it straight away. And it was also because the, it's such a great band. I mean, that, that oh, band. you were playing with a lot of great people. You know, so. oh, that, that band, it was Steve Ferroni and Greg Fielding, Nathan East, Ray Cooper. You know, it was the best band in the world. And they were great people to work with. And they, they helped me a lot. And you were touring at the time after that all over the world, pretty much, right? You... Yeah, we did, a, we did a massive world tour. I've just got to plug my computer in one second. Yeah, sure. Take, take it down. This all meeting right. is being recorded. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, you, you say that after Journeyman, you guys 
decided to go on tour and it was like a long tour, like pretty much. It was two years, pretty much, of everywhere in the world, including Africa, which was quite strange. But um, no, we did a, a load of gigs and we did a couple of really great American tours, European, we did everywhere, pretty much. Yeah. Is it difficult to be out of the home for, if you're, you know, young guy, and married or with little kids, is it difficult to to be in the road for the loan. I think you come back home for a week and then you go for another two months, you come back for a week and go three months. Is how, um, how you manage, you know, that? My wife was very understanding, my first wife. Initially she was, anyway. Uh, and, um, and it was just, you know, it's something that I needed to do and she knew that, you know, she, music was my first love. Yeah. And so, you know, she never really stood in the way of that. It's difficult though because you know you're your own and you have kids and some people can manage and people cannot manage. I mean, it's, for me, I, I where I live here close to Washington D.C., I'm able to see close to between 40 and 50 gigs a year. So I'm very likely because every band comes this way. And I mean, literally every band comes this way. So I see a lot of shows and I show up at the venue of 7 p.m. I drink a couple of beers. I see two hours music, come back home at 10, 11, I go to work. I, I have no idea how the women got there or the guy have a good night's sleep or the flight was late or they angry with the, the crew or, you know, any argument the night before. It's- well, I, I love being on the road. I, I still love being on the road. I look forward yeah. to doing gigs. I mean, it's just two, two or three hours of, you know, the best thing that I can do. Yeah. And I look forward to gigs. The, the traveling and the hotels, it's part of the part of yeah. the games. I don't mind it at all. It, it happened to you that sometime you wake up in another city <laughs> in a different hotel. You don't know how you got there, or you need, yeah. need somebody to call you at six o'clock in the morning. Hey, we need to catch another flight to go to Amsterdam or whatever. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's yeah, but that's that's I don't know. That's part of the, the adventure. You know, you don't get to know that many cities because you, you're there for a day or two and then go somewhere else, go somewhere else. So you're getting paid good money, but, you know, it's, uh, I suppose that's... I, you know, I used to make an effort uh, to, to try and see the cities that I was in if, if I had the, the opportunity. As, as you say, sometimes you, you get there and you do the gig and you leave the next morning. But uh, with Eric, it wasn't always like that. I mean, we, we used to tend to do three or four gigs in a week. So um, you get yeah. a bit of to have a couple of days off to, yeah. you know, get to know Rome a little bit or whatever, Berlin, Munich, wherever you were in the time. You end up doing a lot of album with Eric the, after the journey met with the 24 night, the yeah. best of Eric Clapton, the complete Clapton, forever, man. And those are very good albums, man. So. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was a great time. And as I say, it was the best band in the world. And I was very privileged to be part of it. Yeah. Plus, you were playing with a lot of great musicians around you, so that was unbelievable. And uh, feel free to elaborate when uh, I think um, you were any, I don't know if it was the show with, uh, feel free to elaborate on the Steve Ray Bond uh, at the time of the accident. I think you were you were there as well. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a night, bad night. Uh, and uh, there's a story in the book. Oh, no. yeah. I'll tell you briefly, I'll tell you briefly, but um, yeah. we, uh, we did the show and um, Stevie Ray was supporting us that night. And yeah. uh, Eric and I had stood by the side of the stage watching him and he was on fire. It was just, I think, the, the, the best player I've ever seen. And uh, we, Eric and I looked at each other and said, follow that, you know. But anyway, we finished the gig and um, the, the management had organized uh, some helicopters to, to get back to Chicago. And um, there were four helicopters in a field uh, the, behind the stage. And the guy said, just get on the first one you see. And they're all going back to Chicago. And um, I think it was Nathan that decided to stick around. So they were, they got, there was a free seat on one of the helicopters. So uh, Stevie Ray asked if he could uh, have the free seat. And 
the rest is kind of history. But there's a little add on to that because um, I, I got on one helicopter and I threw my bag in, in the back. And uh, I, I heard Steve Ferrone calling me from across in another helicopter. He said, come in this one, this, uh, come with me in this one. And I saw I, le I left my bag in the helicopter and I got in with Steve. And um, Stevie Ray Vaughan got in the helicopter that I'd been in and uh, he didn't make it. Very tough. Man. He was an unbelievable guy. Very good person, very good musician. So. Incredible musician. I never yeah. saw him play and I have I own have several CDs of his music and uh, he was he was an animal. I mean, uh, it totally, powerful, you know? yeah, I mean, amazing technique. Yeah. He and he, he's the best of I've seen, there's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, like in bass, people, when people talk about Jaco, you know, and uh, Pastorius, I mean, he's in the guitar business and uh, he's, he's way up there. Eric Clapton, of course, yourself. And uh, it's, uh, there are people that are very gifted that were born to do a particular job in life, I think, you know, and, uh, and, um, and, and then I think that in between um, when, when, like you mentioned with, when when Eric Clapton was singing or changing guitar, you you were you were the main man and you know and uh, you did a lot of solos that are very famous, right? So yeah, um, there was one particular gig we did uh, in '91, a place called Nebworth. Um, oh yeah, that's a famous. And it was a great gig. It was 120,000 people there, and um, and it was being shown on TV live. I think. And during the during the the first solo of "Before You Accuse Me," which is a twelve-bar blues in E, um, Eric broke a string, and um, and we, he got to the second solo, and he looked over and he said, "Take it, Phil." And it's the first time I've played a solo in that particular song. And as I say, it's a twelve-bar blues in E. It's not record, not rocket science, but. Um, I, I launched into a solo on that and, and kind of got away with it. Um, but the interesting thing about that gig was that uh, this is the first time I'd met Mark Knopfler. Oh, yeah. I've because there, there was a collaboration between uh, Eric and Dire Straits for that gig only. And uh, Eric and a couple of the other guys from Dire Straits came on with us during that gig. Um, so whilst I'm doing that solo in front of all those people on television, blah, 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 I looked over and I saw Eric Clapton speaking to Mark Knopfler at the side, <laughs> side of the stage. And I, I thought, well, you know, if I can do this, I can pretty much do anything. I, I wasn't nervous, really. I just played. Yeah. And it was instinct and experience by that point. You know, don't be, don't be phased by what was going on around you you just got to play yeah that's right and that's a famous festival i think uh, elton john phil Collins with genesis or uh, McCartney many, before were planned jimmy page yeah, yeah i mean yeah. it was an amazing festival it was a weekend and, and kind of everybody was on it. it those things don't really happen anymore no. um but it was a big charity event for a thing called the silver clef uh, children's charity i think Yep. So, you know, everybody was on that gig. So you say Genesis and um, I think uh, Paul McCartney was on the next day. So I got to meet Paul McCartney. Yeah. Yeah, Tears for so yeah they were on there. My yeah. God, man. It was a great, great festival. As I say, it doesn't happen anymore. But um, that they used to happen a lot during those, the, that period then. Hmm. A lot of the things I did during that period... Uh, well, I got part, you know, as a session player, I would get asked to do the house band thing. And uh, so I remember one occasion, uh, the Queen's Jubilee, I think it was in the Garden of Buckingham Palace. And again, it was one of those events where everybody kind of showed up to, to play. And I was in the house band and um, along with Pino Palladino and Phil Collins on drums, a nice band. And uh, so, yeah, uh, there was a, a few of those things that all happened around that period. There's another one, the concert from Montserrat, uh, 
and I was in the house band for that too. And then Eric was on and Dire Straits were on and uh, Sting was on there and Paul McCartney was on there. And I played for all of them. Wow. It was amazing. Good for you, man. So <laughs> that's what the first time you had that make, um, uh, meeting Mark Knopfler and then you ended up joining Dice Tree after that, right? Or Yeah. 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 Again, I mean, there was a, there was a, interval where I mean some bad stuff happened to Eric he lost his son during that period as well yeah which was very sad and uh, I remember going to the funeral for Connor his name was and um, Eric's manager came up to the band and said listen you know because of this it's it's unlikely we'll be doing much much work for the foreseeable future and he said that you know if any of you get offers to do anything else you should probably take it because I have no idea how long Eric's going to not play for oh. so soon after that um, and because of the Nebworth show really and where I'd met Mark um, I got an offer to join Dire Straits and um, I accepted it and I signed a, a contract to do two years of my life with Dire Straits and um, literally a week after that I had a call from Eric saying, uh, I can't sit around doing nothing. I'm going to do an unplugged album. Well, Can you do it? Yeah. And I said, no. <laughs> I had to say no. And it was a terrible decision. I tried to get out of the Dire Straits tour to do, the, to do Eric's unplugged album, but yeah. I'd already signed the contract, so I couldn't. And um, so that was the beginning of Dire Straits and, and the end of, of, of Eric Clapton, basically. Yeah. How difficult was so easy or difficult was to play as a session player or, or joining Dice Trades? I think Mark was very particular, very picky for what I read and what I heard. I mean, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, I said that the rehearsal period for, for Eric's band was three days. The rehearsal period for Dice Trades was three months. And, three months? Uh, yeah. And um, I... Uh, I understood pretty quickly how uh, difficult Mark could, could be about it. Picky, you're right, it's a good word. Um, he was um, particular, he was very strict about what you played and, and you know, the reference, he was, he was always referencing prior gigs or album tracks and he would, he would do a kind of uh, thing at the end of every day. He said, well, you know, check this part out, you know, because at that point, you have to be playing what I've played on the record, or you, you have to be playing what the guy played uh, on the live show. So it was, um, it was a lot of uh, homework for that. And, um, so, you know, Mark had a particular way of playing, I still has a particular way of playing, which is quite unique the way he plays. It's uh, thumb and, and, and finger, you know. And uh, he said, I want you to study that. Um, the way I play it's, it's almost like a banjo technique in a way and so I, I remember sitting at home studying that for a few nights and I, I came back to the, uh, the rehearsal and uh, I said is this right he said yeah he said you pretty much got that and um, stuff like that I mean it was it's all part of the process of learning I mean, I'm still learning you know and I pick up things from other other guitar players, you know, their particular style, which is always fascinating for me. It's I, I it's intriguing to, to discover, you know, Jimi Hendrix played in, in the way that he did because, you know, he played the guitar upside down for a start yeah. um, and had a particular technique. And Stevie Ray Vaughan was another one. You yeah. know, he had a technique which was particular to him. So I'm, I'm fascinated by that, and I'm always learning new things, even now. Yeah. The beautiful thing that helped you, that you you were a session musician for many years, way before you started your advice. So a session musician, you need to adjust. You do. You go in the morning to do, hey, I want you to play with Johnny for an hour here, then you go home, lunch, and then you go to another studio in London, play with Peter, whatever the name would be. And so you're used to, you know, changing and, you listen yes. to me, oh no, okay, let me give me, let me try this, and then after an hour you got it, and then you, you go home yeah. and get pay. And... That's pretty much it, yeah. I mean, in the early days of sessions, um, a session would last three hours. 
Yeah. And, and so you, I could do three different sessions at three different studios from yeah. three different artists in one day. And so I, I had a, you know, an assortment of guitars and amps that I used to carry around with me to cover all eventualities, acoustics and electrics and various yeah. stuff. So, because you, you never knew what you were walking into, and uh, and I got pretty good at you know at doing that, and being flexible and, and understanding the you know the, the vibe of the music and the, uh, the requirements of the artist, and uh, it made me um, you know I got very comfortable with it really. And it, when you go to a session, how they prepare something for you? You need to listen to stuff before. So let's say a new artist that you we don't know his or her music and they put like a record, a CD or a tape. And when you, this is something like. Yeah. What we like to play and then. Often get a reference, yeah. A reference, uh, yeah. Uh, play, yeah, like Chet Atkins or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and it was always fascinating to try and latch on to what they, what they needed and, but you know, I would not usually get a part, you know, a, a piece of music. I, I never w became good at reading. I, never, I was never a good reader um, because back in those days, you would be expected to contribute something of yourself. Oh, okay, yeah. So, and so you know, the, you you get a guideline, you get a, a an idea of what they wanted, and then you would adapt it to what you could actually do. And that's right. that's the way I did sessions, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's good. No, just copy exactly what a person have done before in the album, but you know, have play something similar, but bring your own being the the film style and the, the film. I remember style, there, right? there was so. kind of a magic moment, um, although it, you know, it didn't happen overnight. But um, from the early sessions I did, people would give me the. Uh, the, um, the direction of what they wanted me to play. And suddenly, you know, they play this like Jimi Hendrix or play this like Eric Clapton. But suddenly start, people started to ask me to play like Phil Palmer. And it was, um, oh, yeah. and that was a, it was a magical moment. You know, suddenly everything got a lot easier <laughs> because I was able to just be me. Be yourself, yeah, yeah. I'm quite sure, quite sure, because you did too many sessions, you may have stories when you went to a studio and um, you know play with a new person and and uh, you may have close your eyes and you said, man, this guy is complicated and what I'm doing here. You you happen to you, you want to close your eyes, say, man, what I'm yeah, the man is good, I'm gonna get paid good money per a couple of hours, but I'd rather be at home with my kids or watching TV. Whatever, right? No, that, that never happened. No, no, really? Oh, yeah. Never happened. I was always able to, you know, I think with a very few exceptions, I was able to contribute something that was yeah. acceptable to the. You, you mentioned David Sylvian. He was one of those. Because yeah, oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about Sylvian. Yeah. Sylvian was very also, I don't know, weird. I don't know if it's the correct word or not, but very particular guy. and. It's, I, I, of course, I have not met all of them, but some musicians are, I, I, you know, I read interviews and I have seen YouTube videos and I have, some of them, I have met them. Some people are very, very particular and are, it's, I don't know, easy, hard to get along with them. Sometimes I suppose, you know, you. It was part of it, part of you know, part of the it. yeah. That's where that's where you're in the business you are, you know. To, On a social level too, you know, you had to kind of understand the sense of humor and uh, yeah, and their requirements. Um, and I got good at doing that. And David Sylvian, although his music was pretty complex. I always enjoyed his sessions, and I think it's some of my best work was on those albums. Yeah. Uh, because they were so experimental and, um, you know, you, he would ask me to contribute something, you know, come up with something interesting here. And so that, that you know, that was, that was great for me. I loved that. Yeah, you, you I mean, tracks like now we're talking about it, about that we're talking about Sylvian and um, 
you play with Orpheus and when the poet dream of angel, the secret of behind, and you did. And yeah. the album 84, 86, 87, Brilliant Trees, Come to Earth, Secret of Behind, Brilliant Trees, uh, Come for David, Everything or Nothing. Man, I'm, those are, I, I'm, I'm admired, you know, David Sylvian. Me too. Also, he, he, he's, uh, with, he's a little odd, I think. <laughs> I want to get a lot of hate mail for that, but, but mm -hmm. he's different, I suppose. That's the correct word to say. And, and uh, mm -hmm. most of his music is more obscure, but he's brilliant. I mean, uh, it's, absolutely brilliant, yeah. And the, his yeah. Uh, association with Sakamoto was another one of those. Sakamoto, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those kind of electric uh, things going on between the two of them was really fascinating. They would, uh, you know, explore some pretty unusual areas, and uh, that was always great to be around. So the two of them were in the studio. You, they were trying different things. You stay aside and. Hey, you guys done? Okay, now I play my part. And, and... Yeah, but you know, they would, during those sessions, they would expect you to be on, on their level, you know, and, uh, and find something that nobody's done before. And I think we managed to do that. Yeah, yeah. But the type of music that David was playing and performing that with, with Sakamoto was is very different from what you. Yeah, but, used to do, but as I say, you're a professional, so you can adjust to the, the grounding that I had uh, of, of session playing. You never knew what you were walking into, so nothing That's was right. really a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Do you take up end up taking for the book a, a lot of pictures for every people that you have played? And well, I wish I had it was obviously it's before the days of mobile phones, so you couldn't yeah. really do it. I wish I had. I mean, there's a few pictures in the book which I managed to snap. There's one of yeah. Frank Lapper in there, which, uh, you know, I just happened to have a camera on that day. I don't know why. Um, but, yeah, I wish I had. I mean, I, I met some amazing people, and I wish I had, you know, selfies, but... Uh, That's right, yeah. They weren't existed then. They didn't exist. And then you... How you... You know, when you decided to write the book, and we'll talk later about that, do you... How you end up? You end up writing like a a log for everything that you have done. How you remember, for example, that in '83, you know, you, you did a session with this person, then you went on tour the week after that, and then you come back and you did another session. You you used to write like a log or a, no, a book, an I agenda? Didn't no, I didn't. But I did have a very strange experience on the where I'd. Uh, I was on tour with an Italian boy called Eros Ramazzotti and we'd, we'd, we'd got to Sao Paulo at three in the morning. We had to leave the hotel again two hours later, five in the morning. Wow. And I, I remember getting my, my stuff packed and ready to go and sort of lying down on the bed with my clothes on. And I went into this weird kind of trance, a, a half sleep kind of thing. And... Um, I started getting all these images and flashbacks and uh, sensations um, about my past. Really? And, yeah, it was very strange. And it was like having a, a video of your life in front of you with a, with a remote control. Hey, stop, pause, for, fast forward, go back. And reliving moments that I thought were completely forgotten. It was a very strange experience. But I started writing the book then. In fact, when I got down into the notes on my phone, uh, then it didn't stop for like two years. And uh, it's, a, it's interesting that um, once you open the door into a memory like that, Ooh. then there's other doors inside that you can, you can go and explore. And uh, I started researching myself on, online and finding out about all these things that I've done. And it's something I suddenly realized that um, and a lot of stuff had gone past. But when you're doing it, you know, when you're doing these sessions and when you're working with these great people, it kind of goes flashing by. You just, you know, you're looking always ahead. You're always looking to the next gig, whatever. And um, it, I didn't take much notice of it, but starting to do the research, I, I started to realize that, you know, there were probably 500 albums. My God. And, you know, and, yeah, you know, there's a there's a good site. 
it's probably the same one you're looking at now yeah. uh, to do research on myself and look at all these things that I've been doing. Yeah. And some of them I've completely forgotten about. And, but once you've reestablished, you know, open the door into, into that area of your life, then it comes, comes back and I wrote it all down. Yeah. I think you had like a, maybe like a out of body experience or people that sometimes are kind of dying or leaving their body yeah. They, they they see the whole they examine the whole life that's where you've heard like a, yeah. a movie of the whole life that you can path with forward and and, and it's yeah. it's amazing that you were to when wake up and and write the stuff down for three days and because I was, stop. once i started it was it was like a drug i just wanted to find out more yeah but it, it was a very strange experience and it didn't happen before and it hasn't happened since so um, it was definitely something weird well, yeah, I'm glad that happened to you because, you know, that was uh, kind of the beginning of the book. But um, 500 records, you have most of them or all of them or some of them? No, I don't. I started uh, to collect vinyl copies of everything that I played on up to about 1984 or five. Yeah. But then it got uh, difficult and I stopped doing it. I wish I wish I had, but I didn't. Yeah, you, you, what did, that's what you listen at home nowadays? You. Do you listen to other people's music and your vinyl CDs? Or? No, I don't have a, a player at home. Um, you don't? No, I don't. I wish I had. But I don't have a vinyl player. I should get one. Because I still had those albums from the, you know, the 80s that I, I played on. I well, love I, vinyl. I love the sound of vinyl. It's brilliant. Oh, absolutely. 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 That's very good. I have, like I mentioned to you before, I have, a huge music collection. I, I mean, for me, I don't like digital much. Well, the quality is not, it's different from vinyl, but for me, like opening the vinyl, seeing the picture, seeing the inserts, mm. it's a beautiful thing, you know? Yeah, I As opposed to nowadays, the young kids, like like my son, who is 19, right? He listens, download stuff, they don't buy CDs. And they listen to 10 seconds, next, next, next. Oh, That's no. kind of weird way of yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, music you know it's, uh... it, was, it was the joy i remember uh, you know there was a friend of mine had a, a big system in his home and we would all go out we'd all go around there and drink a few beers and listen to the new stevie wonder album or wherever you know yeah. and just enjoy it uh, you know 20 people in a room all saying oh, yes this is a fabulous tune blah, blah, blah. and that kind of interaction that feedback you know People don't yeah. do it anymore. It's a shame. The people, they yeah, they consume, and then you need to turn the vinyls on the other side, and you know, listen and compare. Hey, I like the second. Let's put it again, and it's, yeah. it's very, very different, uh, very different experience that uh, listen to vinyl than play to yeah. kind of stuff. So how? And um, then in '93, you you assemble a band called Spin. I think the first and the one and two, right? Spin with, one two, yeah. Yeah, with 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 Phil, with Steve. Man, Tony Levin. Yeah. My God, and, man. And Paul Carrick, yeah. I mean, and Paul Carrick as well, yeah. Those are big names, man. Uh, well, Plus you yourself, know, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things. I mean, um, it, that was born out of uh, a conversation I had with a good friend of mine who uh, worked at that time for Sony Music in, uh, in Milan. Um, and... I'd finished the Dire Straits thing and, uh, you know, we were sitting having lunch and he said, what do you want to do now? And um, he said, why don't you make a solo album? And I'd never considered doing a solo album. You know, I, I don't really think I'm cut out for a solo album. Um, so we came up with the concept of Spin One Two, which basically was a, an album of covers before everybody was doing an album of covers. And uh, we, uh, he said, well, you put a band together and I wrote a few names down on a, on a, on a napkin at lunch. And he said, well, you get you contact your friends, which was Steve Ferroni, Tony Levin, Paul Carrick. And the, the producer was a guy called Rupert Hine, who I was very friendly with. And, um, he said, you talk to the guys, I'll get the finance from Sony and, you know, let's do it. And that yeah. was the start of that. And we spent one week in the studio uh, putting the album together and 
everything was pretty much put down live, including some of the vocals where Paul was playing Hammond and singing live at the same time. Mm. And it was a, a, a joyous week's work and everyone had a great time. And, uh, and then it's, you, you hear it from the vinyl, you know, it's, it's live. It's, it's good Absolutely. fun. The, were, the, were the sales of that particular vinyl were okay? I mean, the Sony and the recorded an investment in a way, or? Uh, they, they did okay, I think. I mean, it was one of those things, there was, it was a, a record company issue because uh, promotion for an album like that, apparently, I've, I've learned in retrospect, that it should be financed by the country that it's released in. And um, because it was uh, financed initially from Italian Sony, um, they didn't have the budgets to, to uh, distribute it worldwide. But uh, it did okay in the countries it got released. And um, it's become a kind of a cult album. And um, people ask me still today, yeah. when, when we're going to do Spin 1, 2, 2. And uh, we have the conversation every now and again with Steve and with Tony. The problem with putting a band together like that again is that everyone is so busy. Yeah. To get everyone in the same place at the same time is very difficult. So, yeah. But it may I never say never. It may still happen. Yeah, Tony. Tony is uh, playing with these two buddies uh, with the stick men, hmm. with Mastelotto and, and uh, Mark Reuter. And then uh, he's going to be joining Peter Gabriel again from his tour that started in June next year. So, yeah. right, like you say, it's hard to, you know, put all of them together in a room for a week and no instructions. Very and it looks good on paper, but it's difficult to do. You know, all of them are playing with other bands, playing with other people, doing other stuff, making a little bit of money on yeah. different scales. Some people, they don't want to play anymore. They're okay. And yeah, everyone's up for doing it. It's just that we can't actually physically get everyone together at the same time. We did try a couple of times. Yeah. But it's, it's impossible. It seems impossible at the moment. Yeah, well, feel free to elaborate on uh, creating the Dire Strait legacy. Hmm. You will play with Alan Carr, Trevor Holmes, Danny, Matt Collins, Steve, Marco. Man, those are big names, man. It, it was a, a strange little thing that came about by accident, really. Um, the... Um, the guy that put it together is Italian, right? And his name is Marco Caviglia. Yeah. And uh, I was, I think it's before I started living here, but um, he invited a few of us. He was a dire straight nut, Mark Knopfler nut, actually. And he spent a lot of his life um, studying Mark's technique and you know, learning all the dire straits catalog. And he had a couple of tribute bands to you know, Dire Straits tribute band. But he was always looking above that. And um, he invited us, a couple of us over to Rome to see the tennis tournament. There's a big tennis tournament every April in, in Rome. And um, so I arrived to see that tournament. And also John Ilsley was there from Dire Straits. And um, I think Guy Fletcher and Alan Clark and um, maybe Danny too, I can't remember. I mean, all, and that, it, was, it was the first time we'd all seen each other since the end of the Dire Straits tour. And it was a, it was a great, you know, it was a great chance to, to see everybody again after all that time. And we sat down and we had a, a, a boozy lunch and um, after the third bottle of you know, red wine, we started, Marco came up with the idea of, of putting a, a band together to do, to play a Dire Straits set. And everyone said, oh, that'd be ridiculous, you know. Never, never work out. But, um, you know, later on in the evening, we all kind of agreed to do it. And Marco put together a gig just outside Rome. And uh, we did like a two hours rehearsal. Everybody remembered the tunes anyway. And, uh, <clears throat> and 10,000 people showed up at this, this venue, right? And really? We, yeah. We were completely shocked at you know, the, the level of uh, excitement about Dire Straits re you know, being together again. Except it was without Mark Knopfler, of course. Yeah. And um, so we did this gig and we all kind of looked at each other and we said, 
Maybe we should do a few more of these. You know? We're doing okay. You know? <laughs> and so it was born then. I mean, I'm talking 10 years ago. That, and it gradually it came together. And we started to do proper tours. And, um, and uh, we explored South America. Because Dye Straits had never been to South America. All right, yeah. yeah. So we went down there. And we were playing football stadiums. You know? Yeah. Just like Dire Straits. Which which countries in South America do you remember? Or? Uh, um, Brazil primarily. Well, they, we we did worked in Chile and uh, Argentina. Argentina. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you guys, uh, yeah. Go ahead. And you guys were recently here in the United States. I think you play in New York in August. Yeah, right? it was this year, right? Yeah, we'll do a couple of you know little jaunts every year. Um, and next year looks very promising because uh, they want us back in South America again yeah. for, a, for a month, and uh, we'll probably tie that in with a um, with the north, hopefully the west coast of America this time. Um, and you know, it's an ongoing thing. People just love Dire Straits music. They love Mark Knopfler songs, and uh, it's it's a joy, you know, to to look down into the audience and see everybody singing the songs that you're playing. Um, the interesting thing is it's not just people of our age, it's young kids too, yeah. who are fascinated by the, you know, that, that period of music and you know, either through their parents or through their own research. People, people love good music, that's the thing. I, I, was, um, uh, I saw before a Genesis end of return, like I told you before, I, I saw Genesis uh, three times, four times last year. And I flew to London to see the last three shows of Genesis at the O2. And they, they are three generations, you know, people like the 50, yes. 60, that they have the kids that are in the 30s, they are bringing their own kids that are 18, 20. So yeah. you you see, you know, people that really like music and know, yes, people in the 50 or 60, you know, it's a... It's encouraging because, you yeah. know, that we can, we can continue doing it. You know? Yeah. And we still we've got an audience, and as you say, it's the songs. It's, it's not enough the songs that uh, yeah. it's it's just snapshots of people's lives in there, you know. And oh yes, yeah, yeah. people weeping, you know, when you play Romeo and Juliet uh, yeah. or something like that. That you know, obviously meant a great deal to them when they were eighteen or eighteen twenty, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any any any? So you you mentioned that you would be touring and. Uh, South America and then the, the West Coast and you know any any possibility that Mark may be joining that? No, no. Uh, Mark's very happy doing what he's doing and uh, he's in the studio now. And yeah. uh, Dan, Danny's in the studio with him at the moment. Um, and he's, you know, Mark's problem was, and I remember having the conversation with him when I was on tour with Dire Straits. He said that he missed the intimacy. Of, of playing to an audience, and, and he said he didn't like doing the big football stadiums. The big football. There was no intimacy. He said he didn't feel there was anything coming back from the audiences. So that's when he decided, you know, he wanted to scale back to do smaller venues just as himself, and that's what he's been doing for the last twenty years. Cool. Yeah, and obviously playing a big venue there. The money is much, much better, of course, because you get, yeah, you get well, different kind of money versus more. But, but not a consideration for Mark. Yeah, but if you have done well in your life, then right. Uh, yeah, I mean, he still loves to play music and he still loves yeah. to make albums, but you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to do the big venues anymore. It's as simple as that. Really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. You um. It looking back in, in your life, you think that you have have changed or people that you wish you have played with, although you have played with everybody in town, man. It's uh, uh, one of my big influences throughout my musical career has been Donald Fagan of Stevie Dan. Oh, Stevie Dan. And I love Stevie Dan. I love that music. I love his yeah. music. Um and that's one thing that I, that's an ambition that I still have is to do a Steely Dan album or Donald Fagan album. I would love to do that. If he's listening, Donald, here I am. 
Yeah. Any way you can contact the guy, or you know, I yeah, I, I saw them. They they well. They were touring this year. I saw them a couple of times. The gig is unbelievable. So yeah. well polished. They were like they're amazing. Ten to fifteen musicians. Amen. Everybody played the part. The ticket was expensive, but people were so happy. Very very polished. Very well done. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, the songs are beautifully crafted. The chords are always interesting. You know, the, you know, the lyrics, even the lyrics of Steely Dan songs are a little journey into somewhere that you've never been, you know, and I love that. Um, I, I would dearly love to, to do something like that, something complex and, uh, you know, a music that can really get inside. You know? No, uh, absolutely, man. And feel free to men uh, mention before I forget that when the time you end up meeting uh, Frank Zappa. Oh yeah, that that's a good story too. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting little thing, and it was just another session. It was early on in my session career, and um, I'd established a, 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 a reputation, and um, this thing came up, and for an uh, for an Indian violin player called El Shankar. Yeah. Who's still very active? I think he worked with Peter Gabriel quite a bit, um, and he was he was in London to do an album, and uh, it was one another session. It was a week session at a place called Advision Studios, right in the centre of London. And I remember arriving on a Monday morning. It was raining, uh, ten o'clock in the morning, and walking into the studio, setting up my stuff. And I looked into the control room, and Frank Zappa was sitting there, and I didn't know he was going to be there. Wow. He was the producer and he, he, you know, he enjoyed the music of El Shankar and decided that he wanted to produce it. And um, it was a fascinating week. And it was really uh, quite complex music. Now, there's a track on, on that album called Darlene, which is about three minutes long and it's based upon an Indian raga. So the, the time signature is, is variable, shall we say. <laughs> Um, but it's based on a, a kind of an Indian piece, and it's for us at the time. I remember being you know, amazed by it and co uh, confused by it, and, and so was uh, the drummer on the session, who's Simon Phillips. Oh, yeah. uh, don't, you know Simon. Um, still works with Toto, I think. Um, but even Simon was having real problems with it. And Simon's a great reader; uh, he can follow anything. Yeah. Um, but he, we all had problems with it because it was so complex. But it turned into a, a glorious piece of music. It took us three days to, to get it right. Um, and this is before the days of digital editing, of course. So, you know, everything was played. Yeah. And so if you didn't get it right, then you had to re-record it again. We did 70-something takes of it, and finally we got it right. Yeah. And it's a great little piece of music. And if uh, anyone's... Yeah, you want to have a check it out. It's uh, it's fascinating. It's cool yeah, should, yeah so, so I interviewed Simon Phillips. He's a very nice person too, as well. Yeah, uh, you could, he used yeah. to be with Toto, and then he's doing his own thing. And uh, man, Frank Zappa is amazing, man. And seventy what? takes, seventy takes of that song. Yeah, over th over a couple of days. Yeah. My God, it, man, it's great. It's a great little thing. And you know, if anyone wants to check it out. I mean, the time, yeah. time signature is insane. Uh, it starts off in 5-8, but goes all over the place. And there's an 11-16 bar in, in there somewhere. And it's not the sort of thing you can even count. And you kind of just have to learn it. And, but, and the only way to do that is to keep doing it over and over again. Until you get it. Until you get it right. Feel free to elaborate on the Tears for Free Earth. You did the, the Hurt in 19... 83 and then in the 205 songs of the big chair how was how it's like to be with those guys in the same room uh, again it was a fascinating and unique experience uh, the first album i did with them it was the start of midi and, and all that stuff and, uh, yep. and the whole music business became obsessed with midi and uh you know things triggering other things and uh and drum machines you know, triggering everything. So it was, uh, I remember walking to the control room at a place called the farmyard and there were cables everywhere, things joining, you know, MIDI cables joining things up to other things and uh, 
all this stuff going on. And it was my first kind of experience of you know, being a kind of organic player to walk into something that was, you know, modern and uh, where the music business went uh, eventually. And so it was an interesting experience. But great. I mean, I loved I loved Tears for Fears. I think they were. I think Songs from the Big Chair was my favorite album of the eighties. It's yeah. a great album. It's a great. Oh, I, I agree with it. Yeah. For me, like I told you before, I have a wide range of stuff. I I like the music. I don't like, but there's the Genesis, the Pink Floyd, Peter Gabriel, Pat Benatar, that Blondie, Coldplay, Ed Clapton, blah blah blah. Right, and uh, there's. There's bad music, according to me, but there's a lot of great music there. And the two albums, uh, yeah, that, that album in particular, uh, for Tears for Fears, is, is unbelievable. Both. It, uh, it is. Yeah, it is groundbreaking. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. What's your take on, at the time you, you know, was we're, we used to live in the anal analog world and we went to digital and then well, you don't do that many takes, we can fix it, we need a programmer, and we take one part here, we take one part, to, uh, people put pl together via computer, before you yeah. used to use a tape, take that, take that with a scissor, so to speak, right? And then somebody glue it together and then play, right? So That's exactly how it worked, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it's a double-edged sword. It was great for some things, and uh, the ability to uh, to cut and paste and all that stuff, but at the same time, it made it made music kind of uh, predictable because everything you know, if you copy and paste a, a drum loop, for example, there's never a surprise. Uh, Trevor Horn has a, a very interesting view on it. He said that as soon as you start doing that, um, then the music becomes kind of invisible because there's never a surprise in there, and he deliberately puts a when he's doing a production, he'll put a five four bar in there just to just to wake the people up, you know, just to say, hang on, this is not just a piece of computer work. It's you know, it's it's music, it's it's art. Yeah. And that's the, the thing that I don't like about the digital age yeah. is it, music has become too accessible and you know it, it, there's no mystery anymore. You know, when you walked into a session back in the 70s and 80s, uh, it's a uh, uh, kind of chemistry would happen, you know, because of the people that you're working with or the situation or the song or whatever it may be. That doesn't happen anymore because people can work and record an entire thing on their laptop. And, uh, you know, there's never any interaction with other players. Mm. Uh, and that's the direction that makes a, a recording uh, unbelievable out of this world. No, no swapping files, send you a file, you are in Alaska, you are in China, you are in Tokyo, and some yeah, it's, all, it's, all, it's all brilliant in, in that respect because, you know, you can hold mm, yeah. a piece of music in, in five different countries you know, simultaneously. But uh, yeah. if you don't have the interaction with you know, a few guys in a room all together, bouncing ideas around, then for me, that's that's what made music great. Like like to mention uh, to mention a couple of names. Like you were in the same room with Iggy Pop and and David Bowie, and then some year later Sakamoto and uh, David Sylvian. Those yeah. the, the memories that you have for that are of course very different, right? So it's chemistry, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. At the moment, and uh, you never knew what was going to happen, and it was unpredictable and uh, and special. Yeah, absolutely. The Pet Shop Boys, you mm. did the two or three, two or six, the fundamental, concrete, miracle, minimal. How is how is it like to work with those guys? Man? I loved it actually. I mean, Neil is a bit of a genius in my opinion. Um, no. Neil Tennant is. He's um, great fun. He's great fun to work with, and uh, he was because of uh, all of their previous product had been kind of computerized and stuff he was fascinated by me in the fact that i could latch onto a piece of his music his idea and make it work you know he'd never really ex experienced that before and we got on extremely well and i had great fun doing that album 
again, it was Trevor Horn production, so they're always good fun. Yeah. yeah. How how it's like to be with Trevor? Trevor, I mean, the guy is so unbelievable. I mean, he have done. He was like a revolutionary. Yeah. Eighties and above, you know, and after that, yeah. and he was okay. an unbelievable guy, man. Um, the, I keep seeing a quote. I mean, he's just released a book uh, himself yes. uh, called Invention in the 80s or something. And I think he did. He yeah. invented the music. Oh, he, he actually, he did. Yeah. yeah. I think he really did. The stuff that he did with Seal and Grace Jones and that early stuff that he did was just amazing. Yeah. And yeah, he gave re really recently released, released a book. I'm trying to get a hold of him to see if I can interview. The guy was. Yeah, he was way ahead of the time. He he did stuff that nobody ever thought about um, doing at the time. Totally, and he, you know, Trevor's smart. I mean, he's surrounded. He's, he's always surrounded himself by good young engineers and and musicians, and uh, he he collects all that information from around him and, uh, and comes up with these great ideas. Yeah, unbelievable. What you did. Um, an album, uh, no, a long time ago, where you play with it, it's a band from Ireland called Clanat. Do you remember? You... Wow, that's a, that was another Trevor Horn thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Was... I, I really love that band as, I, as well. Like, I, like I like a lot of music for different. Yeah, so it was another Trevor Holmes. Like... Yeah, my God, man, and that was an interesting crossover because you know Clanat is is traditional Irish music. Of course it is. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. With, with, with Trevor behind the. Uh, the controls it was it took on a different kind of angle but it was great fun and i like them a lot I'm, I'm a big fan of traditional irish music anyway i mean it's, it's part of my uh my early um experience was in ireland i, I did a couple of irish albums notably with a good that guy that i already mentioned called paul brady yeah uh, but a, a couple of other things. Gay and Terry Woods was one of the first albums I ever worked on, and it was really traditional. And I did it in Dublin, and uh, I I learned how to drink Guinness, and um, we had a great time. And uh, I spent a lot of time going around Ireland with various people, and uh, just fell in love with the whole Irish thing. You know, people singing in pubs and people playing mm. in. A violin in the pub and stuff like that. It's fabulous, really. Yeah, if, you, my, if you like Clanad, definitely you it, you might know another band called Iona. I don't oh, know yeah. if you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're very good music as well. Yeah, that yeah. it takes a while to uh, appreciate uh, kind of Irish music. And um, uh, Lorena McKinnett also, she's from Canada. Uh, it's very good stuff. There's a lot of good music out there, man. Yeah, like my my wife complained. Why do you keep on buying vinyl? Why do you keep on buying CDs or seeing to my show? Because it's different. Yeah. You know, Chinese food is different from Italian food, or it's yeah. or Vietnamese food, and so so forth. You know, are 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 two different things. Yeah, it's all called music, but or great music, but there are, there's a, a lot of different things there. And uh, you you play with uh, Phil Collins in the album. Play well with others in 2018. How's it like to be with? Phil Collins, well, you have played with him before, but... Uh... I love, love Phil. I mean, I'm, I'm sad to see him these days because he's, he can't play anymore, but uh, yeah. still wins. Um, but a lovely boy, uh, and I really always got on very well with, with Phil Collins. And uh, we did some nice projects together, including some of those house band things that I mentioned before. Yeah. And he was really conscientious, you know. He would, he would always be the first one at rehearsals. He would always be prepared. You know, I, I didn't really expect that, uh, but he'd, he'd write himself out parts and he would learn the songs at home and, and always on the board. Very nice guy, a great player. Yeah. Did you did any collaboration with Peter Gabriel at all? Or uh, I had, <laughs> I had a, a couple of days down at Real World with him early on. Real World Studios, yeah. When he was recording um, Shot the Monkey. What was that, what was that album? I can't remember what album it was on, but uh, we we explored a few avenues. I think I was too mainstream for him at the time, and um, I remember driving away from the studio thinking it didn't go great. It didn't go very well, um, and I think part of part of the problem is that we were both quite nervous of each other. Um, 
Yeah, he's quite shy, and so am I. Um, <laughs> so we didn't really communicate on a on a personal level too well. So I think the music uh, suffered because of that. The experiments that we made suffered because of that. But you know, it's one of those things. I'd love to work with him now. I, mean, I was down at Real World recently, really uh, doing an album, and it's it's a fabulous place to work. Well, it's unbelievable. I've never been there, and, uh, but I have seen the pictures, of course, the website, and it's unbelievable. All the all the room that they had, the red room, the oak room, and yeah. the, the, the the wood uh, mixed with metals, and yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's very beautiful. It's a, it's a great atmosphere down there, and um, the, a massive control room. You know, oh they, yeah, 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 it's huge, and you look out uh, over the English countryside and the river that runs through the studio. It's a, it's a glorious place, really glorious. How often do you go to London or to, I mean, to the UK? Go oh, often. You know, I've got my kids there, so I've got two sons. Um, yeah. And now grandchildren. So, yeah, I get, I, I get there whenever I can. Yeah. Do you uh, talk, now we're talking about Genesis, play anything with Mike Rutherford or you know him or? I know Mike Rutherford, yeah. Um, we did something together. What was it for? Uh, what was it for? Oh, I tell you what it was for. It was for Dave Gilmore. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they worked together a lot for some reason. I don't understand the connection, but they're good, good friends, I guess. And we did, um, let's see, what did we do? We did uh, the 50th anniversary of the Stratocaster. And I was the musical director for that. Yeah, and we managed to persuade Peter Gable to come down and, and play a few songs, which you know, again, as part of the house band, I, I worked with him. But uh, Phil was there as well, Manzanier. Yeah, that's a track part for two or four. That's that's unbelievable. I saw the, the list of people uh, when I was preparing questions for the interview. It's, it's unbelievable the people that were there in that that particular venue, and it's unbelievable. Man. It was a good moment. Yeah. Yeah, fun. All right, the George Michael. All right, yeah, you, you know, the uh, the listen without uh, the sort of the last century patient live in London Symphonica. Man, unbelievable! How it's like to play with the guy? It uh, to be he, with him. It was um, hmm. it was a strange gig for me. I mean. Okay. The first album that I did with, with George was just me and him wow. really, and an engineer in, in, in the studio putting very basic ideas of songs together. And so it was all acoustic guitar and George. And um, it was an interesting experience. And I learned very early on with, with George that not to try and do anything too clever or too complex because musically he, he, he didn't want that. He wanted a like a blank canvas to, to sing on. You know, and you, you, so my function during those early days was to be the kind of wash, if you like, something that he could sing against, something that he could tune with, something that he could play around rhythmically with. And um, so a lot of those early songs on that album um, were just me and him in the studio. It was a, sometimes a stressful really to, to work with George yeah because you know it's no secret he used to smoke a lot yeah. of, of cannabis and um, sometimes he would go off into a direction which I didn't quite understand because I didn't smoke a lot of cannabis but um, it was often quite difficult to interpret what he was looking for but uh, we hit it off you know music I suppose I worked with George for 30 years on and off. So I guess, you know, that was, he enjoyed what I did. As long as I never got in the way, you know, if, um, if I did something too distracting, he would say, yeah. Because the, the whole thing about George Michael's songs was that it had to be George Michael on top, like a big cherry, you know. He, he, would, he would spend a long time developing songs to very basic backing tracks. To, to find his, his best range and his best licks, his best vocal tricks and stuff like that. Mm. And that's you need to be in the background, so to speak, so 
Very much so. It, so it wouldn't interfere with his voice very much, right? So exactly, yeah. If I did anything too interesting, he would say no. Yeah, I never, I never, unfortunately, I never saw him play live. It's one of these two bands that I really came he myself for not seeing him and David Bowie. I never saw David Bowie or. or uh, George was amazing live, and I know it always amazed me that he was uh, able to sing at such a high quality after taking so many drugs. Yeah. But, and he, he did every night. I mean, it was um, always yeah. off yeah. his place. And it's no secret. I'm not, you know, not telling any tales out of school. That's right. And uh, he, he was, he was, that was somebody. Uh, you need to take a break or your wife calling you or no? No, it's fine. It's just stuff going on. Sorry. I need okay. to take a pretty soon. You, you want me to, to pause it? You want to take a uh, water? Or? Let me take a pee and get a yeah, pause. Yeah. This meeting is being recorded. Yeah, the guys um, were talking about uh, George Michael. Some believe, I, as I mentioned before, I, I wish I have had the opportunity to see him play live and uh, or David Bowie. He, they didn't come too much to United States to play here. And so unfortunately, I, I, I miss the guy. And, um, was unbelievable. Tina Turner, the band of the big name. Yeah, no, I love Tina. She is a, you know, a, a classic, great singer, great vibe. She was great fun. I, I liked working with her. Did yeah. a couple of albums with her and, um, and, and a European tour, which was an interesting experience. Yeah, you did the, the 208, the 210, the 214 love song, what love had to do with it. It's, um, man, today you have appeared in over 500 albums and over 5,000 songs. My God, man. man. That's a rough estimate, yeah. Quite sure there's a lot more there, you know, can't it? <laughs> well, that, that's probably about right. I mean, you know, that's excluding things that get re released or you know, remastered or whatever. Mm. So it's probably more than that. But uh, you released an album, I mean, the album, the, the book recently. What was the motivation to doing that? I mean, get it out of your system for your kids? What was it? Yeah, I guess it was for my kids. Um, although the, the, the initial spark, as, as I've described already, we came in South America in a very strange way. But it's um, it became... Session man, yeah, of course, yeah. It, it became, uh, I just started to really enjoy doing it and um, during periods of inactivity when I wasn't working for example I would spend all day just just putting it together and um, I found a really good guy that started to help me to edit it and plus it was long originally it was too long I'd, uh, I'd, I'd made a few basic mistakes I mean that's the first time I've written the book so and the guy in, that, in England, helped me to uh, edit it and put it together in a, in a, in a good way. And then was, uh, how long did it take uh, the end to end, like a year or something? About a year, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah probably a year of, when I wasn't working, I would be working on the book, you know. And then um, I suppose to bring memory, you need to research yourself, right? Go to the web and say, you know, what, what the internet knows about Phil Palmer, and, and yeah. I'm pretty sure they bring a lot of memories and uh, a lot of stuff they never even thought about or play with them, you know. Yeah, as I say, some of it had gone flashing by, and I forgot all about it. But um, researching myself was uh, interesting because it uh, opened memories that I'd, you know, that had gone basically, and you're able to. And I, I spoke to a few of the guys that I, I used to work with, and uh, they helped me. Uh, There's a few anecdotes in the book that I'd, I'd got from other people from, from the period yeah. that I completely forgot about. How are the sales of the book going? They're doing okay? It does well. It's ticking over. I mean, um, yeah. if I do a, you know, a book signing or something, which I'm starting to do, uh, or, or something online like this, I did... Um, I did a nice uh, online thing for a, a 
company called Anderton's recently, which got 18,000 views or something. We sold a few books through that. So yeah. little, little books like that really help. Yeah, I, w- I will put the link of the, your website and the, the, the link to the book so people can buy the book. It's, the book is very good, very good. And it, um, okay. you know, it's available just in a hard copy or, 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 or these. No. Yeah, you can do it as a as a Kindle version. Uh, Kindle, right? Yeah, in Amazon you can get it. Yeah. Amazon, yeah. But you know, I, it's got pictures in it and, and good stuff in it, so it's like a like an album cover. Really, it's probably worth getting just for that. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I have the book upstairs, and um, a friend from the UK sent the book. I couldn't find it here in Amazon, somewhere somehow. I, I looked at the internet and and a friend sent me from 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 London. Okay. It's a very, very good book. I mean, I recommend people to read. It's a whole life story. And, and yeah, maybe do like a signing tour in a couple of cities in Europe and go to London. Yeah. Or, what uh, should it's you get? Plan for next year. I mean, we would have done it before, but it would totally put an end to that. Yeah. Now you lead in, in, in Italy now. I think you you play with uh, Renato Cero, right? Well, occasionally. Sorry, that light's a bit bright, isn't it? Yeah. Occasionally. Um, I did a couple of albums for Renato and I wrote quite a few of the songs for him. So it was, um, it was a different kind of uh, hat, if you like, for me to get involved in production and songwriting. But, you know, one has to keep reinventing oneself. Absolutely, yeah. But I did a really nice thing for another Italian artist recently um, down in a place called Caserta, which is down near Naples. Uh, an open air concert, an album that I had recorded with Claudio back in the 80s, uh, which was the, I think it's still the biggest selling Italian album ever. Um, and it was, you know, it was, we decided, he decided that he wanted to do a, a live version of, of the album. Yeah. So he invited me down and we had a 65 piece orchestra. And, um, and and 50 choir, 50 people in the choir. So there's 123 people on stage. And wow. um, <laughs> and it was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. It was quite challenging, but um, oh, yeah. very, very nice. What are, you, what are you working nowadays? What's coming up for you? Um, what's coming up for me? Um, up to Christmas, not very much. I'm doing a gig on New Year's Eve here for an Italian artist called Max Gadze, who's a, a bit of a friend. And so uh, up to then, not much. Um, I'm doing a, a, a bit of research on um, some book signing stuff for early next year. And uh, Dire Straits Legacy will be going to South America in March. So that's that's the next stuff. I'm, I'm sort of working on an album with Trevor Horn at the yeah. moment. And wow. One of his one of his reinvention albums where he finds songs and gets does new versions of them with interesting artists. So that's good. The Trevor Home guy is like on fire. I mean, he's reinventing himself every day. <laughs> yeah, no, he's amazing, Trevor. He's a, he's a good good chum. I mean, we, we work together a lot for the last 20 years. And so, you know, I, even if I just pop around for dinner, which I do quite often. Yeah. You know, just to chat and uh, reminisce. How's your Italian coming along? It's, language? Not, it's not brilliant. Um, I mean, I can I can get away with it if I'm out on my own. I can pretty much get what I need. Yeah. Um, but uh, <clears throat> they did ask me to do a judge to be a judge on, on an X Factor type program, and uh, I considered it for a while. But the Italian is not yet good enough. Your wife is if if from Italy, right? Correct, yeah. She's Roman, yeah. She's from yeah, Roman. yeah. So, uh, so uh, when the two of you argue, maybe she speak Italian, you speak English, and yeah, well, you know, <laughs> English. A lot of people speak English around me, so yeah. So, I really should study. In fact, you know what? I did study during the first lockdown. I, I set aside two hours every day to learn Italian, and it made no difference whatsoever. <laughs> 
It's a complicated thing. I mean, the, the verbs, the Italian verbs are a nightmare. The masculine and feminine thing is, is too complicated for my old brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we could say the language of music, that's better, right? So uh, uh, two more questions. Uh, a French composer, uh, Claude Debussy, said, music is the space between the notes. What, what do you, it took that's me a while to understand this stuff. Yeah. What, what what you? Of, one of my favorite musical quotes. I think it's so relevant to even today. Oh, absolutely, yeah. um, you know, there's great guitar players around, you know, great young guitar players, and you can see them all online and they can fly around the fingerboard and they can do all this amazing mm. stuff. Yeah. But then you, you go and watch Eric Clapton and you, or you know, someone like him, or who's my other, Derek Trucks, you know, the slide player. And you realize that it's, you can hold one note across three changes and it's, it says so much more than, than all those notes that the other guy plays. It's, mm. it's soul, it's passion, it's uh, feeling. Mm. That's why it's so relevant. And uh, it's definitely something that I, I use as a, as a concept when I'm doing guitar solos. Yes. Yeah, it's it's clever to be able to you know play a thousand notes in a second, but it doesn't really mean much. And I think my style of guitar playing is very much the Claude Debussy Debussy kind of thing. I got you. I got you. Where are you? Um, any of your kids are into music or, or no? No. No. One of them's almost a doctor. He's been at university for seven years, studying to be a doctor. So he's nearly there. And the other guy, is, the older guy, is, uh, Oliver, is, is a school teacher. Good for you. You, you like teaching as well? Yeah, you think you you teach a little bit online? For... Yeah, I've been doing it now. Uh, I've got a couple of regular guys, um, and they're improving. There's one guy lives not far from you, I think, in Washington, um, called Lance, Lance Odermatt. Yep. Was, uh, and we've been working together now for two years. And once a week, and he's really come on a, a treat. He's playing really good now. Good for you. Good for him too as well. Well, was, feel free to mention the book again. Uh, feel free to show the book where because I want to put yeah. a link where yeah. people can buy it and go and buy it. this. Yeah. It's a good read, so, so I understand. Yeah. So don't tell me. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. Plus, yeah. it's a very nice picture as well, man. So, yeah. You know. For people that have not read the book, you know, go ahead and buy the book and read it. And it was very nice talking to you, Phil. And um, yeah, let's get in touch. And then we'd like to take you out to dinner. As I said, I'm going to be with my son, going to London, like the third week of December. And then next year's to Italy uh, a couple of times, I think. So we need to get together for dinner. We can try those great uh, Italian food, man. It sounds great, man. Let's do that. Yeah, it was very nice talking to you, man. Thank you, you too, Claudia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Talk to you again.